Okay, I have 15 minutes and 120 slides to tell my whole life story, so strap in. <laughs> Here we go. When I was a kid in the black and white 1950s, as you can see, I wanted three things, a bicycle, a time machine, and a superpower. <laughs> now, these weren't just random things. I needed the bicycle to get down to the end of the street, to see my friends. I needed the superpower because back in our day, we were fighting for truth, justice, and the American way. And the time machine was just something that I wanted. Well, I ended up with the bicycle. And then as I grew older and got in a rock band in the swinging 60s, I found that I really needed three things still, which were the superpower, the time machine, and a girlfriend. <laughs> uh, with great effort, I found that I actually did get a girlfriend. Um, so anyway, in the psychedelic 70s, I went to college with my bicycle and my girlfriend, and I decided that I was going to be a writer for the rest of my life. And I accidentally kind of threw myself into the past. It wasn't really on purpose, but I started studying the classics. So I was studying Shakespeare and Hemingway and Milton and Chaucer. And what other friends do we have? Bronte, my friend Twain, Samuel Johnson, Kafka. And so for four years, I really lived in the past. I wasn't in the present time. I don't know what time it was. So eventually, I got out of college with my bicycle and my girlfriend and my degree in English literature. And I really needed only one thing at that time, which was a job. Uh, by this time, I'd figured out that there probably uh, was not going to be a time machine. I probably wasn't going to get a superpower. But oddly enough, almost by coincidence and accident, I threw myself into the historic seacoast of New Hampshire. And so this is a really, really cool place. And I'm from here, sort of now. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about that. And this is full, this is a place full of old houses into the 1600s and winding roads and this, this environment we have, this incredible environment, this watery environment. And in the last few years, Portsmouth, since I've been here for 40 years, has really come back from what was a really rough time a couple of hundred years ago. Things were really going badly around here. Um, and it, so if you want to think about why that happened, you have to imagine what's going on here. So we have this little speck of New Hampshire that touches the sea, which is next to this long coastline of Massachusetts that curves around, and this long, 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 rocky coastline of Maine. And we're kind of stuck right in there with just 18, 17 miles of seacoast. There's no other place like this in the United States. No other coastal state has this little of a connection to the ocean that feeds it. So if you think of this really as a piece of pizza, and you think of what the first piece you would bite into is, you kind of get an image of what New Hampshire is. There's just this one tasty little juicy spot <laughs> where everybody goes. And well, Maine has 33,000 islands, we have five. So what we do is we dig in very, very deep to the little bit we have. And I'll bet there are people all over New Hampshire, probably in the mountains and the lakes and the cities and the suburbs and the farms that don't even know we have a seacoast. But if they look at the state seal for a couple of seconds, they'll realize that there's a boat being built there. So these boats are what brought the Europeans here about 400 years ago. Just about everybody that arrived, arrived early by boat. They had really no choice. And they came to the only port, because Portsmouth is New Hampshire's only seaport, something that is not duplicated in any other coastal state. And if you look at where Portsmouth is, it's located down the Piscataqua River, or up, I never get that right, uh, let's say about three miles. And this Piscataqua River, one of the deepest, fastest flowing navigable rivers in, in, the, in the region, in, in all of North America, became for a while a really important port. It really was for 100, 150 years. This is where everything was happening. The, the West India trade was happening here. We were a giant shipbuilding place. Uh, the whole colonial government was here, and we evolved this kind of social capital in which all these people were kind of pretending to be the hot shots of England and the hot shots of Virginia, and we ended up with all these mansions and these fancy wealthy people. Well, that kind of peaked around 1800, and things started to go downhill. Between the Revolution and the War of 1812, 
There were three devastating fires in downtown Portsmouth. The West India trade kind of faded out and fell apart. The rich, wealthy people either died, their kids said, let's get the heck out of town, and they went to cities and they moved west, young man. And this place kind of rotted away. The, sea, the, the waterfront especially kind of fell apart. So we were left with all these old, beat-up, cool mansions from people who used to be rich who had left. And that's the way it was. If it wasn't for the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard and a couple of breweries, the whole town might have fallen apart. And what we forget is a lot of the other major port cities grew and grew and grew. And Portsmouth never got any bigger. In fact, it got smaller as little towns broke off. Now we have only 20,000 people still living here. So what happened was the natural thing for the people of Portsmouth was to sit around and say, let's talk about Portsmouth, but you're not going to talk about the present because it sucks, and you're not going to talk about the future because it's grim. So you talk about the past. And so these stories of how cool Portsmouth used to be got into the bloodstream, got into the fabric of this region, so that 100, 200 years later, we're still telling those same stories about how cool it used to be here. And so when I came to town about 40 years ago with my bicycle and my girlfriend and my degree in English literature, what I found was that I was being told these stories that didn't really sound exactly like American history, but sort of like American history. So, you know, down south, uh, America was founded for religious freedom. But up here, we said, huh? We were founded because people were fishing and they were trying to make a living or they were indentured servants or they were slaves or they were adventurers. This is not what we were founded for. And I thought, well, that's not what my history book told me. They didn't tell me that it was founded because of commercial fishing. And then you got this weird little story where in 1623, three years after Plymouth is founded, they send Miles Standish up because they're starving and they need fish. And where do they go? To the only two people living in New Hampshire. And we sold them some fish. And yea, thereupon they celebrated, look it up, the second Thanksgiving. <laughs> and it's not really in the history. So when we talk about Paul Revere, what we're talking about is not, not Lexington and Concord, but we're talking about four months before Lexington and Concord, where Paul Revere gets on his horse and rides all the way up here shouting the British are coming, and he gets all the locals freaked out, and they attack the local king's fort because remember, we're all British, and they take away the king's guns and the king's gunpowder, and their shots are fired, and this is the beginning of the American Revolution, except that it doesn't make it into the history books, and that's just our story. So here we are learning about John Paul Jones, a guy who leaves where? Portsmouth, New Hampshire, in a ship built on the Piscataqua. And he goes off in the American Revolution, and he attacks the entire country of England with one boat. <laughs> and you would think that this would be the most important event in American history, but nobody ever really talks about it. You know, George Washington actually came here for four days. He had his portrait painted. This is what he actually looks like, okay? And this was painted in Portsmouth. He came here with his secretary, Tobias Lear, who was born in Portsmouth. His house is still here. Very important person. Lear was holding Washington's hand when Washington died at Mount Vernon, and yet, where do you hear about Tobias Lear? You don't hear the stories. You don't hear the story of Ruth Blay, hanged in South Cemetery, not far from here, for the crime of concealing the existence of her stillborn child. So these stories were just being told by everyone everywhere. And they kept welling up out of this tiny little speck of a place. And they kept coming up and coming up. And every time I heard one, I heard 10. And it was like the loaves and the fishes. And yet none of them seemed to fit in the history books. They weren't there. You would look them up, and they wouldn't be there. And yet we were telling them because they were our version of the founding of America. Look at this flag that John Paul Jones takes with him. It looks like our flag, but not really like our flag. It's like the bizarro world version. <laughs> You know, it's the, f it's the other dimension of America, and this is our dimension. This is what we do. We tell the story, but it's kind of got a twist or a turn. And so because we're digging so deep and we have so little space, we end up with stories that actually have women in them, not just white guys fighting wars. We have African Americans. We have immigrants. We have people of all races and creeds. Because we're digging this history out, like we're digging the meat out of a lobster claw. We need to tell every single story. And it turns out that it wasn't over in the revolution. It actually, our history continued. Who knew that the huge war that had killed 600,000 men, a war between Russia and Japan, would end here 
on the Piscataqua. Now, we celebrate that, the Japanese celebrate that, but you barely will find it in your history books. Who knew an FB-111 crashed into the most populated part of Portsmouth in 1981, and no one died? They were, we were told that there were no Native Americans around here. They were definitely not at the Alza Shoals. And two years ago, while we were out on Smutty Nose, up comes the artifacts, and they're 6,000 years old. So we know that they were out there fishing. And we, no one but we, have the story of Betty and Barney Hill, <laughs> the first people ever abducted by aliens. You can't beat that when you're telling the really alternate history of the world. Now, my heroes are people like Valerie Cunningham, we did not know we had an African-American history. It was barely written about in one or two essays, and in 25 and 30 years of study, Valerie found these people, she named them, she gave these people, invisible people, names, she told us how they fit into the community and what they were part of, and what our region had been in terms of African-Americans. And then 10 years ago, right where she put the plaque, digging under the streets of Portsmouth, we found the lost burial ground of maybe 200 African Americans that we had paved over. And now we're going to make a monument there, and there'll be more stories. So anyway, I wrote and wrote and stole and stole and took all these stories and recycled them as much as I could. And then one day, I woke up, and I really couldn't see. I just couldn't see, which is why I'm down here and not up on the stage. And the doctors didn't know what it was, and nobody could figure it out. But suddenly, I wasn't blind, but, but I couldn't see really good like people should. And so I could, could never drive a car again, which I haven't done in 15 years. I couldn't read a book. I couldn't see a newspaper except for the headlines. And yet I had a girlfriend, and I had a bicycle. And I was not too bad a shape because there were miracles everywhere I turned. Somebody had invented this machine that makes words big. And I got one. I got two. And suddenly, not only was I seeing what I had seen before, but I was seeing it better. I was seeing it deeper. I was, I was paying more attention than I'd ever paid before because stuff was big and giant, and I was looking at it. And I got this incredible computer that talks to me like Stephen Hawking's, and I can talk back to it, and it writes down what I say, and then it reads it back to me. And everywhere I look, there were tools and toys and things that I could learn about. Somebody suddenly just said, hey, there's the World Wide Web. And there were hundreds and then thousands and then millions and then billions of websites filled with stuff, people throwing information at me, and I didn't have to go anywhere. I just sat where I sat in some invisible car, drove around the world, and every, showed me every street and house and garbage can that existed in the world. And so I could just stay at my desk. I got, a, I got an e-reader. Matter of fact, I was just watching this show on this with this cat about an hour ago, and I was able to have books read to me, and I got a little device that was like a little microphone, and it records hundreds of hours, and a little camera, and a little video camera, and so I could go places and record stuff, and somehow when I get home through this wireless cloud that I know, have no knowledge of, it's at my desk, all there, translated, talking to me ready for me to study. And I made a special arrangement with Google so that they would take 10 million books and they would put them online. I don't know if you knew that was me setting that all up, but uh, I would like to thank them. So now I have 10 million books that I don't have to go and find anywhere else. And suddenly I found myself Skyping and talking and emailing and all these things with every expert everywhere. I could find everyone. There they were, just sitting there. So I didn't have to know anything anymore. All I had to do was contact people, and they would give me the information. And I could find more information than, say, any college professor at Harvard had ever been able to access without leaving my chair. So suddenly what I found out was that I, was, I, I could just do everything faster I, I, I could see further, I could jump higher, I could leap buildings with a tall whatever, you know. Uh, and, and, and so what I realized kind of strangely, oddly occurred to me, even as I was putting together this show, that I had found my superpower. It was just waiting for me to pick it up. It was there. And, and so what I ended up in with the situation now, if you think of this, if this, if this quote is true, and if all history is local, okay, and the universe can be seen in a mustard seed, 
then why do I need to go anywhere? Why should I leave? Why should I travel around? If I'm just in Portsmouth downtown, there's a dozen, two dozen great museums and historic houses and sites to see. There's another dozen or so, uh, two dozen in the seacoast. There's another dozen or two at Strawberry Bank. So if you go down to what you think is Prescott Park, down on the waterfront, and you stand there, or you go to Strawberry Bank, you are actually walking where the entire European history of Americans have walked. For 400, almost 400 years now, people have been wandering around here. And what we find is, it isn't a static history. It isn't that something happened and that's exactly what happened and that's how it was. It's a changing, dynamic story of America it isn't the story you thought. And oddly, I calculated the other day that of our 44 presidents, 22 of them have actually walked the streets of Portsmouth. And, and both George Washington and Barack Obama have actually walked right through Strawberry Bank. So you have to ask yourself why they come here. And they come here because we are telling the real story of America. We are telling it with all its warts and flaws. We're telling the story of what actually happened in this country, and, and we're telling a story that's more complicated, that's more dynamic, that's changeable. It doesn't sit and become one thing in a textbook and grow yellow and old. It's always different. It's always changing. And so what we do is we come to these places because we want to be connected to the past. We don't want to be in the past. We don't want to live in the past. We want to be connected with the past, and that's why we come to places that look and feel old. And that's sort of what Portsmouth provided for us. So we have a place that we can come to where possibly our great-great-great-great-grandfather and our great-great-great-great-granddaughter might have met. Anyways, I, I ended up finding out that I, I got the whole package. My wife helped me set up the shed in our backyard and turn it into kind of like a, a writing studio for me. And I pretty much stay in there just about all the time. I, I, I came out today just to come here. Uh, I'm, I'm there all seasons. You can always reach me. And I'm sitting at the back in my desk. Let me see. There's, there I am. And from there, I can reach every place. I don't need to go anywhere. I don't need to do anything special. I can get on my bike and ride down here, which I did today. And, and I can learn all about this region, but I can also reach into every archive everywhere in the world. I mean, now they're all there. I don't have to go anywhere. And I can reach billions of people, and billions of people can reach me. <laughs> so I got a time machine, too. So, so to close, what I'd just like to note to you is that these miracles which are the miracles of the electronic things that have happened in the last few years, are widely available. If you have a cell phone, you have everything I have. Okay, So this is not just something that's exclusive to me. And as much as I'd like to tell you the story of Portsmouth endlessly over and over again and have you discover Portsmouth, uh, what I really want to do is ask for your help. And what I need you to do is to get in your time machine and to turn on your superpowers and to tell us your stories. Okay, I tell us the stories of you. Tell us the stories of your family, your relatives, your neighborhood, your city, your town. Tell us the stories of America. And if we all do this, we're going to find out what this country is all about because I hate to tell you something, but there's one thing a historian knows more than anybody is that history lies. Okay, did I change that yet? There we go. So what you find out is that what you read in books is not necessarily what happened. Uh, Samuel Johnson said this best. Let me see if I can read this from here. Many things which are false, help me along, are transmitted. are transmitted from book to book and gain credit in the world. You get it? Okay, don't trust it just because you read it, particularly if it's in a newspaper, and I write for newspapers too. So why couldn't we just have a nation of historians? What's stopping you? You've got a cell phone. Why can't you tell all these stories? You can access all the information. And what we're going to end up with is a history of America that's more honest and diverse, a history that's more inclusive, and actually what happened, because people in the past didn't have all these tools to see what was going on, and they didn't even have glasses, okay? And what you're going to find out is the truth, justice, and the American way is a moving target, okay? What is the American way? It changes. 
And so what I was searching for for a kid, as a kid, I didn't realize is something that was changing and changing and changing all the time. I'm not supposed to get near the speaker, but let me try this. So I'm back in college, I'm reading something, and here's Franz Kafka, this guy. And little did I know that Franz Kafka was writing something that a half-blind historian in the Piscataqua would apply to me sitting at a desk with the internet. And this is what Kafka said. You do not need to leave your room, okay? Um, Remain sitting at your table, read along with me, and listen. Do not even listen, simply wait, be quiet, still, and solitary. There's more. Go ahead. The world will freely offer itself to you to be unmasked. It has no choice. It will roll in ecstasy at your feet. Thank you.